Hello, hello, everybody. Hi, hi, hi. I'm 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 so delighted that you've joined us today. And I am so thrilled to have a chance to talk with my wonderful friend and colleague and a most brilliant human being, Tiffany Schlein. And um I, I do want to start this off by acknowledging, and I know we are all deeply, deeply concerned and in pain in a variety of different ways about what's going on in the world right now, and particularly in Israel and, and in the Middle East in general. And um, I just can't not acknowledge that. And particularly, it's very relevant, very dear and raw to both Tiffany and myself as Jewish women with family and friends in Israel, many of whom we don't even know what their situation is. And so we felt that it was important to go forward with this conversation because really what we're talking about today is, is our, our mandate um, as Jewish women to repair the world. That's what we're supposed to be doing. So, um, so we will just jump right in and we will have this conversation and we will take any questions that you have, any comments that you want to make. And, um, I, I think this couldn't be a more opportune moment to talk about the importance of women's leadership in general and the history of women. And so, uh, Tiffany, thank you so much for being here today. Thank, I want to welcome you to take the lead and just uh, tell you how, how much in awe I am of the work that you do. And I'm so excited for you to share your dendrofeminology project that is going to be coming up and that we had a chance to actually walk the Washington Mall together last March and kind of see where it was going to be. So so I got a chance to get a little idea of what the vision is. But as I usually do, Tiffany, can you just start off by telling a little about yourself and how you came to be doing the work that you do? Yeah, so thank you for acknowledging the deep pain and grief because it's been so intense. And um, And I also have always admired your career. So I want to say that because you're you you paved the way for so many women and um and i i mean it's like i'm trying to decide how far back to go with that question i think my work i had two feminist parents um my mother went back to school to get her phd when i was 8 and her thesis was successful women and their female mentors mm -hmm. and we studied alongside of each other and it took her a long time to get her phd cuz she was also a mom and um so watching her do that, um, and unfortunately in her generation, there was a lot of women that felt like they had to divorce to have careers. So I also saw the pain of that and experienced it as a child. And then I also had a father who's no longer with us, but he was a surgeon, but he also was a brilliant writer. And he wrote a lot about feminism. He wrote a book called The Alphabet Versus the Goddess, The Conflict Between Word and Image. And his big question in the book, was why was it that in every single civilization worshiped goddesses and women? And what was the single event that kept happening in every part of the world that changed the goddesses to gods and the degradation of women and patriarchy? So that was like the book I heard. And then he wrote another book called <laughs> Sex, Sex, Time and Power, How Female Sexuality Shaped Human Evolution. And he wrote about in that book, how women the moment that they understood that they could die from childbirth and they said no to sex was when they took back their power and when, when men wanted to take their power back, as we're still seeing today. So that is the DNA I grew up with and the stories I heard and the things they were thinking about that they shared with me all the time. And I think my work is very much from that. And you know, I, I started my, I was a filmmaker who always worked in technology to pay for my films. And one of those stints, like getting out of debt on a documentary was founding the Webby Awards because I was super into technology. So in my 20s, I was um, a very young leader in technology where there was hardly any women. And I was telling the world that the web was going to change the way we lived and worked mm -hmm. and started this award show that became very big at a very... Um, the first wave of the web when not many people knew what it was. So I spent a decade doing that. But um, when I was doing the Webby Awards, um, 
you know, I'd always heard my father, I told you was a surgeon and he used to tell me about um, being in the emergency room with women who would be, who die by giving themselves an abortion with a hanger. Mm -hmm. And he told me those stories and it left such an impression on me. So here I was running the Webby Awards. I'm in my twenties at this point, maybe, maybe I was 31 at this point. Cause I'd been, I ran it for nearly a decade. And, um, and George W. Bush got into power. Um, and the very first thing he did was took away funding for international family planning, which I'm sure you were running Planned Parenthood. Oh, yes, oh, yes, yes, yes. I remember that well. <laughs> um, 2002, 2002. George yeah. W. Bush, yeah, it would be. Yeah. yeah. Is that right? 2001, 2002. Yeah. And it like. It's 2000, it? actually, 2000. He, 2000, yeah. Yeah, he would have actually taken office in 2001. And that was yeah. first and, yeah. And I remember running the Webby's here. I'm having this very successful career as a woman leader running the Webby Awards, which at that point was like very big. And I woke up my activist gene. I just like was like, wait, he just took away funding for family planning. I'm like, and I called the CEO of Planned Parenthood in the Bay Area, Diane Harrison. Mm -hmm. And I remember telling her, I'm like, I want to make a film for you that speaks to my generation. So here I was, I was running the Webby still at that point. But I was always making these short films, running the Webby Awards to explain to the world how the web was changing things. I said, I want to make a short film that has humor and irony that speaks to my generation. So at the point I was 30, 31. And she said, yes. And um, I made this film while I was running the Webby's called Life, Liberty, and the Pursuit of Happiness. And I made it for, for Planned Parenthood, but it ended up getting into Sundance. And that was this really interesting moment for me because it was like, I want to go back to filmmaking combined with everything I've learned with the web to make social change. And that film, um, it was 13 minute film was shown at every Planned Parenthood for the, was it the 30 year anniversary of Roe v. Wade? I guess that's what it was. It was January, 30 year anniversary of Roe v. Wade. I'm at Sundance. I'm fully pregnant, having a big t-shirt that says my choice. There's protesters at the screening. And I just remember being like, this is my work. This is, I want to take everything I've learned from the web and go back to making documentaries. And um, anyway, so then I, that was like a moment where I sold the Webby Awards a couple of, like a year later, and I started a film studio to make documentaries combined with the web to make social change. And I've made quite a few films on, on gender, women's rights, several for Planned Parenthood. And I've also, I also make films on like neuroscience and, um, technology and a lot of other things, but um, sorry, this is such a long answer, but I feel like it's all relevant. It's very relevant. It's very so relevant. I, 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 by the way, I just have to say, uh, Diane Harrison is one of my dear friends. I love her. And it's just nice to hear her name mentioned here uh, as uh, somebody who was She actually, popular. she taught me a lot. I was just thinking about her. She reached out to me with everything going on. Yeah. And, um, you know, I, I make a lot of my films with archival footage and it, it's very hard to find archival footage of not just white people. And we would have a lot of conversations about, I had to dig so much deeper to make it as representat representative of everyone. And I would talk with Diane a lot about that. And she talked, we, it was like a, it was a really interesting conversation about going deeper to make sure the film, anyways, I love her. Yeah. Um, okay, where was I in the journey? So. Anyway, so here I am running a film studio. Now I make documentaries, I do art, I do these global things. And I I was, and I speak a lot, I do a lot of public speaking and I was at this event um, for Vital Voices. It's all like full circle, full circle about in like, I don't know, 2014. And um, I'm backstage and the other speaker was there and we're whispering. I'm like, hi, my name's Tiffany, what do you do? And she's like, oh, my name's Laura Liswood. I'm like, what do you do? She goes, I um I can be world women leaders and yes, I was like Laura. <laughs> you do I'm like what a cool job huh? and she owner said I can be world president women presidents right. and heads of states wasn't just leaders was presidents right. and heads of states of countries and I was like that's so amazing and we're like whispering I'm like how many are there I mean how many are you gathering <laughs> and she said 50 and I was like there's 50 I'm a total feminist. I didn't know there was that many. And then that started me on this whole film called 5050, which it was about me going back into history in my dad's books, in my own history about women leaders throughout history. Mm -hmm. 
And I made this film called 5050, the past, present and future of women in leadership and women in power. And it premiered at Ted women and on refinery 29, when that was still a thing in two weeks before the election, 2016, when we thought we were getting our first woman president. And that, and it ends with this incredible montage of any woman president holding up their hands, swearing the oath. I mean, it's like, and, and then Trump won. And I was like, we were all kind of like the way I've been feeling this week, just this sinking, sinking feeling. And I thought, well, I'm going to create 50, 50 day. And uh, where people can premiere that film all over the world. And we're going to talk about gender equity. And you were involved and you did an incredible event with that. And you wrote a piece for Time Magazine for it. And it became this very big event in the Trump years. And then cut to, I've made a whole bunch of other films. Da, da, da. And then I, uh, COVID happens. And I, like everyone is like, oh my gosh, is the world going to end? And I started spending a lot of time near where I grew up, near Mere Woods, near the oldest trees in the world thinking I need perspective. I need context. And all my movies, I've made like 30 films, um, only one feature, but most of them are shorts. And I always start with historical context. And I love going really back far in time for context. And I'm walking the redwoods. And I was like, I always grew up with Mere Woods, that big tree ring that has, I was so impressed with the concept of like a tree telling time of the story of humanity, but it was always so male and patriarchal. So I thought, I, and I started creating art during COVID and I thought, I want to create a feminist history tree ring. And it was like such a breakthrough creative moment for me. I'm like, I have two daughters. I'm a total feminist. I want to see it. I want to see women's names on that. So I went back to that script, 5050, which I had spent years researching with my co-writer, Sawyer Steele, who's trans, my other co-writer, Jenny Traig, and went through it and distilled what was a 50,000 year, at that point, that was a 10,000 year history, but I went back 50,000 years to when women were worshiped as goddesses and tried to distill all that history into 30 points on a tree ring. And I made this piece called Dendro Feminology, a feminist history tree ring. I showed it to Dr. Nancy O'Reilly. She's like, you have to show it to the National Women's History Museum. Long story, I had a big exhibit last November called Human Nature, and that was the centerpiece sculpture. And in two and a half weeks, that piece of feminist history tree ring will be on the National Mall, November 1st through 4th. And we're having a big feminist gathering and the off the mall headquarters will be at Vital Voices. So it's so full circle to that Laura Liswood story from like eight years ago. Anyway, so it almost feels like all of my work is leading to this moment. And that was the longest answer. I'm so sorry. <laughs> No, I, I think that's great because you really did. Uh, there are several several things that were striking to me as you were talking, Tiffany. And by the way, please feel free if you have questions for Tiffany or questions about anything about Take the Lead, please just feel free to put them in the chat and we'll 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 get them. And we, we would love to answer your questions if you have them or, or comments either. Um, you know, I as as I think one of the questions that has been coming up frequently as people have looked at the world situation, uh, the question has come up, oh, how would the world be different, yeah. in fact, if we had had equal leadership between men and women? Now, I will tell you that if you Google the question of, are women less likely to start a war, you will find that the answer, the, 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 they'll try to give you a no answer. The, the answer is no, that because there are, there are, queens through particularly royals through the years who have been the figureheads right but they weren't elected but anyways part, that's right that's right it, <laughs> and they were they were in their positions because they were able to assume more like male leadership qualities yes. that is that is there's no question about that we know we know that we know so many things about women's leadership today that is so different i mean we know that we know that because of the socialization we've had, which has been different from men and, you know, and, and take the lead, we're always urging women to shift the power paradigm in their own minds from the oppressive power over that has been the narrative of history. It's been all about fighting and wars and scarce resources. And, you know, like I have to fight you in order to get my little crumb to a generative, a generative, um, creative, innovative idea of the power to actually make great things happen in this world. Power, see, I have my little hammer on here. And the metaphor I use is that power is like a hammer. You mm. can build something with it or you can break something apart. And and you're all or about- Or you can build something. 
Yeah, built exactly. That's it. And, and you're all about building. You're all yes. about building something and looking at that history. And I also have a very long list of women who have been left out of history, who yeah. actually did invent things, who actually did yes. start things, and and they were just either either their uh, what they did was was um, either the men involved just took credit for it or right. just simply left out of history because you know they were just women. And I, I I really think that that question of what would the world be like if women and men held equal positions of power is a great one for everybody to think about and to think about what could be different. What could we make different? Yeah. What you're doing is you're offering people the chance to actually think about that in a very visceral, visual kind yeah. of way. Well, a couple of things. Um, I wanted to say that on the tree ring, obviously it's it's six feet in diameter around and I could only fit 30 lines. So there's so much I don't have on there. And that was a great creative challenge on what was I gonna put on there. And there's tons of stuff that I wish I could have. And one of the things we're gonna invite the public to do both on the National Mall and online. So anyone tuning in here, and I'm really excited about this part is um, with the National Women's History Museum, we're gonna invite the public to for, uh, answer three questions from the timeline. One is what's, a line on there that's shaped you or paved a path for you and why two what's something that is not on here that you want on there and then we're going to be making almost like a wiki version of this timeline that's much longer gorgeous includes everything that we feel like should be on there and then third what do you hope is voted on there next so um you know, I'm, I'm really excited to, you know, as an artist, you have to distill that is what filmmaking and making any art, but I'm excited to open source that also. And um, it'd be great to have your work on there. And um, I think the question of what would the world look like if there was more equity in leadership, whether it's women, non-binary, the whole gender spectrum. I, I mean, I, I, as a mother, watching in horror at everything and I know you said the data is that that women lead wars but I just I just in my heart in my heart I don't believe that I don't believe that creators of life would so easily take it away I just don't I I have to speak my truth these days are so hard and there's so much death and suffering right now and I like all you can go to is like what you know in your kishkis, which is like a Yiddish <laughs> word for like your gut. And I just don't believe that. I mean, I also, okay. The reason this power dynamic of like men wanting to control our bodies is I think ultimately because they can't have life, they can't create life in their own bodies. And that is a very powerful skill that only we can do. And I think building these monuments and buildings and wars is like, I mean, they're trying to exert some like power because they're, they don't have this awesome power. So and, they're trying and, to control our bodies. bigger than yours, by the way. Right. I mean, no, trust me. I have my feminist history training right in front of the Washington Monument, which is the most phallic thing you've ever seen. Actually, I want to show, I'm going to share my screen because I feel like it's a good time to show you. Show you what, where I'm putting it. <laughs> There yeah. it is. Let me know. Do you all see that? That is where the feminist history, and that's where Gloria and I, I, I don't know what, how long ago it was. It was the earlier in the year. We took a walk. And I remember, I have to just share, like, you know, I did this artist rendering a long time ago. I'm a big believer. If you have a vision for something, you have to create an image and just keep looking at it every day. So Gloria and I, I'm like, let's walk to the spot. I haven't been to DC in so long. And here I've created this image and trying to make this thing happen. And we walked there and there was no water in that reflecting pool. And I was like, oh my gosh, what's going on? And then we learned that like, there isn't water there all the time, but it's almost like this goes back to leadership. It's like, what vision do you want to create? This is a vision I want to create in our nation's capital that we are part of this country, our contributions matter. We should be in much more leadership position in everywhere. And good things will come because we've seen what the world looks like with mostly male leadership. We're living in it right now from war to war to war. And, um, you know, in a lot of ways, I mean, the irony is like, 
that this is happening amidst among I don't know the right word among this all I'm so like I haven't slept very much this week um all we can do is like I said cling to what we know is true for ourselves believe in greater humanity and and still and I'm clinging to this one to a non-violent world where we can all coexist an interdependent world where we all the cause and effect is just always there and we have to put forth the world we want. So this four-day activation in DC, which I hope you'll join us in person, but there's also lots of ways to join online, is a vision for the world that I want to create. And I want to, with all the people coming, we have leaders from the feminist movement coming in from all over the country. The ERA coalition is doing a big convening. We've got the National Women's History Museum, Women Connect for Good, amazing partners, Planned Parenthood Action Fund, um, GLAAD, you know, my producer is trans. Um, we're very excited. Oh, here's another thing I want to <laughs> underscore is we're very excited about reminding people that feminism as a word is, is for re representation for all that aren't represented. And um, we're really excited to have the trans community um, inside and partnership with this bigger event. Um, so I'll, sh I'll show you this one minute video about the event. Is that okay? Sure. Please do. Yeah. I was always fascinated by that tree ring at the entrance of Mirror Woods or any national park, but they're usually so patriarchal and colonialist, like Christopher Columbus discovered America, like it was being mansplained history. But I love the concept. These trees have borne witness to our humanity and history. And I thought, I want to reimagine what's on a tree ring. So I wanted to do a feminist history tree ring. Women Connect for Good and the National Women's History Museum are sponsoring this for one reason and one reason only. It's going to take every one of us to come together to make this a better world. We're rethinking monuments in the 21st century, and this is a new kind of monument. and take the lead is also a wonderful partner and it's going to be a real coming together and I you know when the Dobbs decision happened it's like nothing happened nothing we didn't march we didn't I think we were also devastated and I know there was a Seneca Falls gathering recently but I feel like there there's never enough gatherings right now and I'm really I feel like it's going to feel really good to gather in DC um, to be in community and to start doing the blueprint of how we're going to get closer to what we want the world to be. Absolutely. Our, our, our power tool number one in the nine leadership power tools that take the lead is, is know your history and you can create the future for choice. Mm. Or know your history. You, you can't, you can't, you can't really understand who you are as a human being. You can't understand the forces that have shaped you and you can't really then have a vision for what you want the future to be. So mm, you are doing that. so powerful. It's so powerful that it's going to have to go into my coursework now. And mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> I love that. That's your first, it is history. I mean, you know, I told you all of my films, like if you watch any one of my films, I spend the first establishing part of the film, like let's go really far back. And, and I mean, the good news is if you go really far back on a lot of issues, we are, we are moving forward. I know it doesn't feel that way, but historically like, and progress doesn't always go forward. It goes like this and you have to keep pushing to make it go forward. And th that kind of engagement is just so vital. Um, but knowing history, e even, even what's happening in the world today, a lot of people don't really understand it. Is a, and I think that's, that's also part is like understanding history and context. And it's so important. You have to know where, how you got to where you are. You have to know what, you know, how, how that all happened or, or else you can't really 
properly judge what needs to be done to fix whatever the problem is right now. And I, I was thinking I'm, I'm going to take a little bit of a of a sidetrack here because because um, I would be remiss if I did not mention the next program that Take the Lead is about to launch, which is called 50 Women Can Change the World in Entrepreneurship. And I just wanted to mention what an amazing entrepreneur you are. Tiffany Schlein, you have obviously figured out how to do what so many artists have never done, which you is know, it's a funny um, word because I, create I, a, I love, create a, <laughs> it's interesting because some of these things, these big visions that you've had, <laughs> I, I never use that. It's a funny, a friend of mine kind of called me out on it recently because there we're part of like this women groups and there's like an entrepreneur group within the women's group. She's like, why aren't you part of that? And I was like, I just never, like, I don't ever then I do see people in their bios list entrepreneur. And I have been, I mean, I've started a lot of things in my life and I figure out how to get the supporters to make it happen. But it's a funny thing. You know why I think I don't use the word entrepreneur, which I'm so curious. With? I think it sounds like a solo thing. Like I'm a convener. And, uh -huh. and actually this entrepreneur group that she was trying to get me to join is called solopreneur. Oh. Because it's specifically for women that run their own businesses. Right. Uh -huh. Yeah. And, yeah. you know, and I have run my own business my whole life. I mean, first the Webby Awards. Um, I mean, I always had a big team, but right now my film studios, my art studios, it's like, it's a small team, but a mighty team. We've worked together for 18 years. And then we have lots of people we work with on specific projects. But I think that word is really interesting. What's the root of entrepreneur? I'm, I don't know. I don't know, but I am going to find out because yeah, I, I think it's good in order to do this program. But I, I will tell you that our you know, what, what we are, so there are a couple of reasons for doing it right now. One is that, and probably the most important one right now is that women are starting new businesses at an astonishing rate. Hmm. And women of color more than, more than the average. Right. Uh, it, it's, and there are many good reasons for it. Number one, you realize you can create your own culture. If right. You create your business, you can create your own culture within that. And if that. The culture yeah. you've been trying to work in has not been a good fit for you or has not felt right to you, or you've not been appreciated, or you have been dismissed in some way. To start your own business, uh, it enables you to create the culture that, that you want to create. Now, let me I just love say that you said easy. that. Not That's easy. Not, but, no, uh, I mean, even like all the Zoom, like the biggest result from the pandemic is the work life change. Like, if you would have told me seven years ago that so many people can work remotely and be home for their kids and like that. And the truth is, is it hasn't been that much of a change for me and my company because I always ran it that way. We always were part remote and I always I unplug on the weekends. So I'm not emailing my staff on the weekends, all these things that people are now demanding, but I didn't want to interrupt you. You said there was another point for the entrepreneur group. Oh, well, well, so, so I think that, you know, there has been all this chatter about, about women uh, not coming back into the workforce and companies right. trying to get back into the workforce and the competition is not other companies the competition is women deciding to start their own company so that they can live their passion live their joy and at the same time provide for their provide for their families and so our purpose in having our 50 women can change the world in entrepreneurship is one of the sectors that we are addressing right now because we've we've done these programs for journalists we've done them for media and entertainment we've done them for healthcare law what else? Uh, I'm sure there's something else that I'm forgetting, but uh, but it, we um, we hadn't done something for for women in business and women owned businesses need to think bigger. What our goal is is to help the women actually be in touch with the power they have to have high levels of intention for mm. their businesses and to think like you think about what is the biggest. Well, actually, I, no, I mean, that, that, can I can I have this art installation on the on the Capitol Mall? Why not? Why, why not? the fuck not? Well, you know, <laughs> I have to tell you, uh, and again, this goes back to my parents. My dad, Leonard Schlein, who died like 14 years ago, we were incredibly close. He used to always say to me, think big. Like literally he would say, think big and his books thought big and he lived very big. And it was like a, a total, and he was an entrepreneur because he was a doctor. So he ran his own business as a doctor. And my mother ran support groups and still to this day is now volunteering. She's 83. She runs them in retirement homes. So gather in circles. So from my father, I got think big and my mother, I got gather in circles. And I feel like DC is again, 
both of those things. Right. And um, I think like, I agree with you. I mean, the, I mean, my next book, so I wrote, I always thought my first book was going to be about making things happen. That was the book I always thought I was meant to write. Because a lot of people say, how did you start the book? How did you do this? And I was like, I actually now at 53, I have a, I have a system. I have a process. I have a, a steps I go through and I want to share it. Like, I feel like that'd be really, like, I want to share what I've learned, whether it's making an art project or a book or the Webbies or a film, like they all go through gathering support, sharing the journey with the world, releasing it to the world, figuring out the learnings. Like there is this process. So I was going to write that book. And then I ended up writing a different book because I felt like an urgency because my, when my father died, which was a really, um, it was like a very dramatic week in my life. My father died and my daughter was born. And it was really one of those moments of like, how do you want to live your life? And my family and I were Jewish. But we're not religious. Um, it's a culture. You can be culturally Jewish, but we started practicing Shabbat from a non-religious perspective where we turn off all screens from Friday night to Saturday night. And it's literally the best thing I've ever done. I cannot wait to turn off the screens tonight because I am so overloaded with images and pain and everything. I need to return to myself. So I ended up writing a book called 24 six, um, the power of unplugging one day a week because it felt urgent. And it felt like here's this ancient Jewish wisdom that anyone can do. We've never needed it more. And that's what I need to share first. But what I'm telling you, especially after doing this experience on the mall, that is going to be my next book. I don't know when I'm going to find the time because you really need focus time to write. But I, that idea of not only making things happen, but I think what you're speaking to with your group is like, think as big as you can, right. think as big as you can and make that image. Like the making of that artist rendering that I made a year ago was a very big part of my process make the image of what you want to have happen and they will come. Love that. You know? Yes, absolutely. You have to have the vision to start with, yeah. but you also have to have the courage to believe yes. you can do it. That's true. Then, then you have to be willing to take the action, however scary it might be, because without the action, the biggest vision in the world cannot really accomplish anything. So it's that- totally. It's gotta, all of it. Gotta actually make it happen. It doesn't just happen on its well, own. Well, that, that's what's so interesting is I'm excited to write this book. I uh, This writer friend of mine, Lee Stein, did this great post recently. She's like, why is it that all the like go and do it books made by women are in the self-help section and the go do it books by men are in the business section? Mm -hmm. And I was like, yes. And this book I want to do is a bit of both because I've been running a business for many years and I've been creating the vision of what I want to do. And it, it is about that combination is how you get really far is when you bring all of that to the table. Um, yeah. That is, that's, that's amazing. Let me just see I, I, if there are any questions, if anybody has any questions or comments they would like to make. And, and meanwhile, uh, Christina, if you don't mind, would you put the links into the chat for both uh, for, for Tiffany and for, Dendro feminology, and then also for for take the leads. Uh, uh, not fifty women can change the world in entrepreneurship. Just so people have those. Yes, and I just put one there. I'm sorry. Yeah, oh, the, okay, I okay, I great. realized, and you know, Perfect. I um, I'm gonna put in the chat both to sign up for DC, which I hope you do because you can be in person or online, and we'll have ways to engage. And then my site there, I have all my films and my book and all the different mediums I work in. Um. Okay. Great. Entrepreneur. So I will, we will, when we, we, we will send out the, uh, we'll send the link to this out, obviously first to the people who registered, whether they were able to attend or not. Great. And we want to make sure that we have all the links that you would like us to include and any descriptions you would like us to include. Sure. So please, please make sure we have those. And I, 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 I just can't wait to be part of this amazing event that you're, you're creating. Is there anything else you want people to know uh, anything that you want to say to wrap it all up here? Yeah. I mean, I think, you know, I'll, I'll kind of lay out what's happening over the four days because we're going to have, um, on November 1st, which is Wednesday, um, which is also the beginning of, um, Native American Heritage Month. We'll have a land acknowledgement there. We'll have some speakers of women that are alive that are on the train, Dolores Huerta, Toronto Burke, the first trans elected Senator, Sarah McBride and others. So there'll be like a speaker portion on, Wednesday, November 1st, 
at 10 a.m. And um, and then on Thursday, we're showing my film 5050 at Vital Voices. And there's an artist um, named Whitney Bradshaw that does photographs women screaming, and she's going to be doing photographing women. And then on Friday, the ERA is having a convening at Vital Voices, which is wonderful. Already 80 organizations are going to be there to talk about the roadmap. And, and then there's going to be a reception. And then we're all walking to, back to the feminist history tree ring. And there's going to be an interfaith Shabbat candlelight, and I think really healing Shabbat. Um, and then we're going to have a silent disco, which I also think will be healing. And then on Saturday, um, the artist um, Michelle Pred is going to be leading a feminist art parade from the White House to my sculpture. And then we're going to have a flash mob dance. And there's also an artist named Autumn Brian who is um, bringing her care machine, which is a vending machine of banned books and abortion pills. And so there's going to be a lot. And we also have voters of tomorrow will be registering people to vote. So we have, um, and then one more thing, um, Rosella Kennedy is an author of Our Brave Foremothers. She wrote a great book and she's curating a list of 20 feminist books. So we have a lot going on. So if you're not in DC and you still wanna participate, you can please sign up at that link because at the end of each day, we'll be doing two to three minute recaps and we'll have, a, we'll have ways for you to engage with these questions we're asking about the tree ring. And um, there, we're gonna have, you know, it'll be, it's a community. Listen, right now, I feel like the, the best moments in this very painful time are being in community. So you will be amongst all the feminist thinkers um, that are gathered. And thank now, you, Gloria. If, if there are other organizations that want to join up with your coalition, yeah. what should they do? Good, I will um, write my producer of 18 years, his name in the chat, and they can write to him, okay. um, Sawyer Steele. And yeah, and so there's lots of ways to plug and engage and be a part of this. We it's open for everyone. Fantastic, fantastic. Well, you are you are truly amazing. Uh, it's uh, I can't wait to be there. Did you want to show people the background in your studio? Oh of, yeah, yeah. Well, right I'm now? at my art studio, and I <laughs> thought it would be interesting <laughs> because there's so many things. Like first of all, people like how, I don't want to get the lighting weird, but. These are my other trainings because I tackle different subjects, but we we spent all this time building this incredible like crate for the tree ring and we sealed it. Oh, and I finished the tree ring last year, but just um, about a month ago, I added a new line to the very end because it ends with, you know, Roe v. Wade's overturn, but 65 other countries have legalized abortion for in the last year. And then it says in 86 countries have elected women leaders as presidents or prime ministers because I didn't want to lead it on just the Dobbs. So it's like the bigger picture, but then I just added a new line that says today, colon, like, like as an invitation of what we do today will affect what's on there tomorrow. And then this um, artist and friend of mine, Randy Philosophy built this huge stand. That's like as sturdy as sturdy can be to be on the Washington. That is, you know, it's funny when people are like, how does it happen? There's like a lot of details to make an art shipper is coming on Monday to send it in. She's a female owned art shipper trucking it across the country to DC. There's like a million details and we have meetings with the National Park Service. It's like, I have learned so much in the last year. And I love, I love learning new things. I have learned so, I have learned so much. People are like, how do you get an art piece on the National Mall? I'm like, let me tell you. <laughs> well, you know, it just goes to show that any, all things are possible. Anything can be done. Exactly. And, uh, and, 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 and you're doing it and you're doing it. So it's very exciting. I can't wait to be there with you. And um, thank you so much for joining us today. I, I, I hope that everybody who has watched it today and who will watch it as we post it on social media in the future will, will join up with this amazing event, be there in Washington, either virtually or in person. Oh, wait, I thought one more thing I forgot to say is that um, we just got a grant to make a, a film about this all, which is very, that's my first language is filmmaking. So we, so when you go to either the DC page or Tiffany Schlein, I have a monthly newsletter, which you'll find out about then, but we're gonna be basically inviting people to read lines from the tree ring. Mm. And then we will turn it into a very powerful short film, probably like four minutes. And then we are gonna offer it back up for free to social profit organizations all over who want to use it themselves. And that is a model we've perfected at my film studio of like answering the question of, like when I made that film for Planned Parenthood, 
after that, so many other um, 501c3s were like, can you make a film for me? Can you? And I couldn't, as I've, I have my own projects and that was my passion project is reproductive rights. But I thought, what if I made one film that spoke to such a high level and I just would change the last line of it to be the mission of the social profit and put their logo. I call them cloud films. We are doing that for this film. So there will be a short film about this art activation and having people all over the country, all different ages, backgrounds, reading lines from the tree ring. And then we'll be offering it back up for organizations to use themselves as their own film with their own logo. So if you wanna stay posted on any of that, you can just yes. sign up my newsletter. All right, okay, that is fantastic. And I suspect there will be many other wonderful new ideas that will come up in the course of, <laughs> of uh, putting this on and then afterward as well. And uh, that, that it's, it's gonna be really great. And the most important thing is not just for it to be a moment in time, but for it to really do what we said at the beginning of this conversation, which is to shape a future that is more loving, kinder, less combative and yeah productive for all of the human beings on the face of the earth to be able to live in peace and prosperity. Amen. That is exactly the way I feel. And I think more love, more leadership from a different place. Yes. I think that's the perfect ending. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tiffany. Thank you, Gloria. I always love talking to you. Thank you.